when we were down at the um, um, North Carolina last summer, one of the uh, locals there in their paleontology group was very interested in misshapen teeth. Okay. Because anytime you find anything that looks deformed or anything, show it to me on there. He's getting photographic records. In some cases, well, here you can have this one. I don't like it and so forth. <coughs> because he said, what well, he says, George, what's George's last name? You know what I mean? Okay. Um, and he said, one of the things he's studying right now is some of these deformities are not deformities per se, they're transitional. He's going to explain how in the world you've got a tooth with five tiny ridges on it and a spike coming down like that, and that's one single tooth. And he's actually looking at it. And he said, we may see some of these things over a relatively short period of time. Right. A lot sooner than what some people are saying. He says, it's right there. He said, some of these things he doesn't believe are actual distortions or disarticulations or misshapens or deformities. It's transitional. Very interesting. And that's, everybody looks up and he says, I want to see all the unusual stuff, the bent, the bent stuff, the broken stuff that looks bad that you just throw away. Well, when we think about transitional features, we, I mean, we think about, you know, like uh, jaws to ears, bones and mammals, and limbs to a fish to tetrapod limbs, or, you know, limb structures to wings, all the big things. And that's really, I think, what the creationists have in mind. They are thinking the big picture, big items. But every little feature, whether it's the shape of a particular nubbin on a bone that changes to give the panda's thumb, or whatever the case may be, are all transitional features. So they could very well be. Small things count too. Anyone else? Um, Bill Shubin told me that uh, on the day that he announced the discovery of Tikhalik, he got about a dozen calls from colleagues saying essentially, congratulations, you just discovered two new gaps in the fossil record. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually oh boy. Uh, very lucky. When I was at the GSA meeting in Philadelphia, I wandered into the Academy of um, Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, I walked up to the front desk and said, hey, you know, I'm from Cincinnati. I know you have Jefferson's bones here on display, or you got them somewhere from Big Bone Lake. Can I see them? And it turned out that the collections manager happened to be at the front desk talking to some people up there, and he said, sure, come on back, I'll take you back. <laughs> so I spent the whole afternoon photographing and touching Thomas Jefferson's, you know, material collected by William Clark in 1807. It was great and nostalgic. The point of my story is, is that Tiktaalik was there. And I said, wow. hey, can you show me Tiktaalik? I figured I'd push to see how far I could get. <laughs> and he said, sure, come on back. <laughs> so we brought the original out wow. for me. Wow. And I got to see him, and they held up the pieces. I didn't touch them, right? I was like, oh, okay. Hold the pieces, and I got to take some photographs. And then he flipped the brain case over, and I took some photographs. He's like, oh, wait a second. Can you erase that picture? It's not published yet. I was like, oh, secretive. And of course, I erased it, and I'm like, you know, I'm a trilobite worker. I don't know what in the world I'm looking at. It's the brain case. But, but it was actually really cool to be able to be there to see him. And that was very, very nice. Yeah. You were talking about the scientists and their publication of transitional forms. Mm -hmm. um, scientists probably wouldn't be necessarily looking for transitional mm -hmm. forms because the reason you would do that might be to prove evolution, which is right. kind of proven. But why would you come across them if you're not looking for them to prove that? Well, I think, I think the idea that I'm trying to, to say is that we come across them all the time and they're not an issue for us. Exactly. So I publish papers on evolution of trilobites and I've um, you know, come across transitional forms. And for me, it's not something that, ooh, look at this, it's a surprise, because it's expected. Okay. It's just, it's just part of the par par parcel. You know, when you document morphology through time, and look at speciation events, and look at phylogenetic trees, what you're doing is documenting transitional fossils. But it's not, like, it doesn't have this public mystique, I don't think, that, that creationists make it out to be as something that is, you know, very hard to do or very, spe you know, rare. It's just not the case. Yeah. Um, I've always heard evolution described in terms of change, the mutation, natural yeah. selection. But at the same time, a snail or a clam still looks like a snail or a clam, Has, and all the major body forms of animals are still here, no new ones have come along. Has anybody looked into why there's so much preservation 
Like why there's so much stability? Yes. And why so that stuff didn't go away a long time ago and replaced by other forms. Well, we have a wonderful group of paleontologists in the room that I know are chomping at the bit to uh, discuss um, stabilizing selection factors, um, environments um, being stable. What might be one reason why that's the case? Where if you, if you have or are adapted particularly to an environment that's fairly stable, there may not be no necessary uh, reason for evolution or change. But, but I work at the level of interspecific variation, and I can tell you that variation of the populations migrate. They change through time, always. They're always in flux. Just depends on the scale that you actually look at. So while it seems that that gastropod has actually, you know, um, at smaller scale or at large scale, seems to have stayed pretty stable during morphology, variation in any feature is doing this through time, <coughs> adjusting to environmental change. Yeah. About how many transitional fossils are uh, on record now? About. That's a good question. I don't have a number. <laughs> okay. Okay. A lot. And I understand there's like a, a new species discovered every, on average, what, every seven weeks? What did you guys say? All the time. Yeah. New species yeah. discovered all the time. Right. Everywhere. Okay. Yeah. By my definition of what I would consider a, tra a transitional fossil, uh, you would be seeing them many times every day, all the time, as paleontologists discover new organisms in the fossil record by how I would consider it a transitional uh, fossil to be. Yeah. Um, I have a question about um, species that might face extinction. How could you change evolution there when their like, habitat is being changed? Well, species adapt, of course, to their changing environment, so that is pretty much evolution occurring. So that is going to be a function of um, natural selection and adapting to any environmental change that's going on. So the two actually are hand in hand. They're part of each other. You have to have one to have the other. If I, if I got your answer correct, or your question right. <laughs> any other questions? All right, pretty straightforward, I think. Nothing, nothing too crazy there. <laughs> Swim vertically and you can't really go very fast. I think this one took care of that a little bit by uh, having a really thick siphon hole which could move forward a little bit more into the into the cone. This is Endocerus cephalopod, not always cephalopod. It's got the original shell still intact and patches on it. From Michigan? Yep. Upper Peninsula, Stonington Peninsula, specifically. Late order. Very big. Cool. Okay. Here's our newest fish. Close up of his mouth. I think he's called a twig catfish. He's an algae eater. And I forget the name, so I hope I'm getting that right. But anyway, Connor wanted him because he eats algae and he's so straight like a twig. He's very unusual looking. It's only about six bucks. Yeah, that's a good view of him.
There he is on top of our glacial erratics, the uh, river rocks that came all the way from Canada by the glaciers. Those are various granites. And that's a uh, okay. our black molly. He's the male. And the little one's the female. We have a new Amazon sword sword tail plant and it's putting off uh, shootlets and it's going to have about nine sh nine little plants that grow from it. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 